Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Conrad Cording, who is the Nathan Mossel University Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor of Bioengineering and Neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania and a co-director of the CIFA Learning in Machines and Brains program. He's the founder of the Community for Rigor and Neuromatch.io. He's interested in understanding the brain as a computational device and how to mine neural data for causal relations. And today the topic of discussion is going to be intersection of data science and neuroscience. So Conrad, really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of our Humble Podcast. It would be great if you could start with a brief background, your intro and your works. Thanks so much for having me, Adi. Um, and it's a great honor for me to be on your podcast. So um, I'm a professor here at UPenn. My... I've always been interested in the big questions for neuroscience and in the best big questions for machine learning. For me at the moment, a lot of the big questions are about causality. You know, like we are really good in machine learning at making predictions, predict the weather tomorrow, predict maybe aspects of the stock market, predict, uh, predict if a word that I say is one word or another word. We're really good at those things. But machine learning at the moment is bad at describing how the world works. Not like between you and me, like the language we use is all about causes. Not like does medicine make you live longer? We don't ask the question, do people who take the medicine live longer? No, that's not what we want. We want like, would I take live longer if I would take the medicine? And so for me, Causality is the big open problem there. And there's like multiple places where that matters. It matters for me as a scientist, because what I want to understand is causality in the brain. How do things influence one another in the brain? But also about causality in the world, you know, like which decisions make a company successful. I don't want to know what the pseudoscience is that a lot of companies that are successful believe in, I want to know which things are actually useful. So so I think causality is fundamental for everything we do. So you started with, you know, like, I mean, uh, what keeps you going is, you know, your drive for understanding the big questions of neuroscience and machine learning. You said the machine learning, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much there. Big questions of neuroscience. Can you elaborate on, on that? And, and, you know, maybe it'll be great also if you could talk about, you know, the causal relations in neuroscience research. Yeah, let's talk about the big questions. So like, ultimately, what do we want of neuroscience? Why is it that society funds neuroscience worldwide? Well, it's because two things. The first thing is understanding brain's promises to help us cure diseases. Uh, brain diseases are arguably among the worst diseases for mankind. Not like we all have friends and family that suffer from dementia when they're old. Maybe they suffer from Parkinson's disease. Maybe they're depressed. Maybe they have schizophrenia. There's like all these things that people suffer from and they are brain based. And therefore the hope is that neuroscience helps us treat the diseases. And then there's the other part, which is, we really want to understand how human brains work, not like because human brains, that's who we are in a way, like kind of like, I think the curiosity about how our brain, how our mind works, is just very deep. And we want to understand how that works. Now, let me take that from, from diseases and from understanding to causality. When it comes to diseases, what we want to know is would something help? We don't want to know is something correlated with good outcomes. Now, like here in America, rich people live considerably longer than poor people. Rich people also take vitamin supplements. These vitamin supplements may be entirely useless, but because rich people buy vitamin supplements and rich people live longer, it will look like taking vitamins is a predictor of your living long. So if we view this in this, if we analyze our data in a simple-minded way, we will stay, say really stupid things about medicine. And the same thing is the case in the brain. Now let's say we have two parts of the brain. We find that they're often active at the same point of time. Well, why is that? It could be that the first brain area activates the second brain area, or that the second brain area activates the first, or that there's other things in your brain happening that affect the first and the second. Now you can say me being alert is a little bit like 
high socioeconomic status. And like me being a lot makes both brain areas be active. You being rich makes you take vitamin supplements and makes you live longer if you're in America. But but what we want is understand of like how reality works. And that's very different, of course. How much do we understand of the human brain today at this point in time? You know, because there are a lot of people who are working various approaches to understand the brain. But what's the current understanding of the brain that we have at this point in time? Arguably, we don't know all that much. No, we do know that without your brain, you wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> but um but but what do we actually know? No, like we know a lot of really good things about the periphery. We know how nerves come in from the body into the brain. We know how nerves from the brain go out to the body. We know an awful lot about spinal reflexes. Not like we hit your patella, uh, your knee, and like you will then kick. And we understand that really quite well. But the more we go onto the inside of the brain, you know, the place where you make, have thoughts and memory and reason about things, the less we understand. And the reason why we understand so little there is because we're talking about billions of nerve cells all talking with one another. And we don't know causality in those systems. And causality is really complicated. No? One nerve cell does another, something to another nerve cell who does it right back to the first one. So it's very difficult to understand this. So you can say, where are we really as neuroscience? We are really good in, on understanding, on causal understanding, on the periphery. Now we understand your eyes quite well. We understand your spinal cord may be OK, at least. We understand your muscles really quite well. But we don't know how like that middle piece, the place where we think how that really works. What can be done to accelerate this process of understanding our human brain? You know, because there are various labs around the world who are taking different approaches to understand the brain. There are people who have kind of, you know, spent their life trying to understand the C. elegans, which is the most basic. Uh, it's got some 300 or, or, or two neurons. There, uh, there's people who have done the, the connectome project of, of the fruit fly, mapped out the entire fruit fly. What are the interesting approaches, ideas of, of you know, understanding our brain better? Where, where, where are we currently uh, with with our, our tech stack and what do you think is needed for us to like maybe better understand or completely understand the structural and the functional capabilities of uh, the human brain? Uh, where do we stand at the moment? So almost everything in neuroscience is correlational. It's predictive. No? You can say, I take a part of your brain and I put you into a scanner and I can then use complicated math to predict activity at that part of the brain. Does that mean I understand the brain? Not at all. Not like you can say, does uh, not like take chat GPT. Not like it's a wonderful analogy of that. Is it really good at predicting your next word? Yes, it's great at predicting your next word. Is it really good at figuring out why you say the next word? No, like it has no notion of it at all. No, it's just been trained to make predictions. In reality, there's a brain of nerve cells interacting with one another. ChatGPT doesn't know anything about that, but it's really good at predicting your next word. And neuroscience is pretty much at that stage. They're like really good at predicting the next activation in your brain. They cannot tell you how it comes about. And because they can, it's arguably not understanding, not like it's predicting. If you predict things, it doesn't mean that you understand it. If you predict what a human says, it doesn't mean at all that you understand how that individual thinks. And I think this confusion of correlation with causation is endemic in neuroscience. Can you elaborate this co correlation and causation? Because, you know, sometimes you feel that co your uh, correlation causation, causation is one, one and the same thing. That's right. And it totally feels like one and the same thing. And I look, the interesting thing is that if you want the kinds of systems that we can think of in our head, in those correlation is causation. Take the light switch that I have here. 
you put up the light, I put up the light switch, the light goes on. And you can say, how do I know that the light switch makes the light happen? And I'll be like, well, when I push it, it turns on. And in a lot of these like simple systems that we can think of, correlation and causation is more or less the same. So why is that coming? Where's that coming from? It turns out that if you make systems bigger and denser, now like in this case, there's only the light switch and the light. There's like coffee cups and all kinds of things in my room, but the coffee cups don't do anything to the light switch. There's only one thing that does something to the light switch, which is like the light switch makes the light happen. No, like it's 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 a very simple causal scheme that we have here. But as we take these causal systems and we make them bigger and more connected, correlation completely ceases to be the same thing as causation. And the 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 difficult thing is that for all the simple th systems that like I can think about in my brain, correlation and causation are almost the same thing. Not like, uh, like there's a drug, like it may, it does an effect. Like if my headache gets better, it's probably like the, the headache drug that I took for it. But that's because the, the drugs that we design are very specific causal. You know, they do one thing, which is like make your headache go away and make your fever go away. But it's not that everything influences everything else. But in your brain, every neuron has about 3,000 inputs and 3,000 outputs on average. So that means that as opposed to this world where we live in, where the light switch does one thing, in the brain, every neuron talks to 3,000 neurons and listens to 3,000 neurons at the same time. In those systems, correlation and causation become very, very different because they all influence one another. So if you want, like your brain generates its own thoughts and because it generates its own thoughts, it's no longer that one neuron does something simple to another neuron. It's something emergent where all those neurons jointly make interesting things happen. And that is why we live in this world where all these little things that we can think of seem to have these simple causal chains, but all the things that matter have these complicated causal chains. And in those complicated systems like brain, like brains and society and companies, correlation and causation are very, very different from one another. Conrad, would you be able to explain your approach of causation in understanding the human brain? Could you could you talk about that? Yes. So imagine you want to know if one part of the brain influences another part of the brain. There are two things that neuroscientists do. The first thing that they do, that most neuroscientists do, is they measure how much activity you have in one part of the brain and they measure how much activity we have in the other uh, part of the brain. Both of them are going to give you temporal traces. Now, in activity, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. What these scientists usually do, then they cal calculate correlations are these two parts of the brain active often at the same time, or do they not do that? If they're active at the same time, they assume that that means that those two parts of the brain talk with one another in a way. There's another approach, a much, much better and more meaningful approach. We go in, we take that one area, and we put a little electrical signal through it. There's a technique called TMS. It's basically a big fat magnet that goes like boom, and there you have extra activity in the brain. And then the question is, what does that, that extra activity do to that other area? And if it does something to the area, the area, you can know that there's a causal effect because you basically zap the brain at a random point of time. So you can confidently establish that the zap in one part of the brain is, produces activity in the other piece. In those cases, we can be sure about causality. We can really understand one area does something for the other areas. And now you can immediately say, well, how can I be confident that we are not, that correlation is not causation in brains? Well, if we do these perturbation experiments in brains, they have very little to do with correlation. We have lots of neurons that are not correlated, that have causal effects on one another. We have lots of neurons that are correlated with one another, that if stimulate them, they don't have an influence on them. So what that means is correlation and causation are just really, really different in brains. Can you talk a little bit more about these trans 
cranial uh, magnetic stimulation that you're talking about and when you zap somebody's head with this little electrical pulses and then you understand that maybe because of the pulse that this electrical pulse you are nudging a certain part of the brain and 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 there's a certain response basis on that through those learnings how do you better understand the brain and what what are the things that you are able to kind of uh assume deduce build out of those learnings let's talk a little bit about what happens with these techniques now like we put uh, we put a coil with lots of uh, lots of runs over their head and we put a very strong current through that so that produces it's it's like an electrical magnet that you turn on for a very short period of time now what what we all learned in physics now like as we change these magnetic fields we have currents so what we have in the brain is we have a little circular current where there's like some current going through the brain now what does the currents do in brains if they hit if they hit nerve cells or if they if they hit the accents or dendrites of neurons they produce voltages there the voltages those currents induce will in some subset of the affected neurons make them become active make them spike so all of a sudden in that brain area you have maybe a few thousand maybe a few million neurons that are now active that wouldn't normally have been active and then you can say we can now see what they do because we can say i look at your brain without doing that and then I do it and I see how what's different in the brain. I should mention in that context, my colleague Desmond Othis here at uh, at UPenn is doing those experiments. They put, he puts people into a brain scanner, so he sees where the brain is active. And then in the scanner, he basically produces this extra activity in some area. And then he can see directly what happens to other areas. And you can also see what happens to behavior. And so that you can then establish what extra activity in some brain area does to other brain areas or yeah. And I should mention there's like two versions of that. There is a version where you look at what's the extra activity. There's another version where you do that for a very long period of time and the neurons kind of get tired. And then you can say it's a bit like we call it a virtual lesion where you can say basically there's this part of the brain that has been very active because we zapped it a lot in the past and therefore now they can no longer be active so you can both ask what happens if there's more activity and also ask what happens if there's less activity in some brain region right. Right. all right would this be the approach to to better understand the brain as in what the language of the brain is because you know there are these electric pulses wiring and firing which creates all of our senses you think that there's some kind of a language going on in in our brain and do you think that we would be able to understand this language yeah it's a it's a great question like we call that language as you call it we call that a code and we are using methods that are called decoding to find out what that language is um things are very complicated though no like there's some codes that are easy for me to see no like if the code is how active is a neuron or how active is a brain region it's a code that i can see very active very easily but you could say what if the neurons transmit information with something like mars language no like they go like beep 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 beep, 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 beep. and in that case, it would be very hard for me to see that if there was a temporal code like Morse code, in particular if it was distributed between different neurons. So uh, that, like finding out what the right codes are, is very difficult. And in general, like, you know, like the brain has eighty-six billion neurons. Uh, they every neuron has three thousand neurons that directly affect it. But if we go like two hops, that thirty thousand, uh, that three thousand becomes nine million. <laughs> if we go like four hops, we more or less reach the whole brain. So um, neurons very densely interact with one another, and therefore the the things that we do with things like TMS, are like very blunt instruments. Now, like it's kind of I take like a random million neurons here, I make them fire more. Why should I expect that that like that? speaks the right language now, like you can say uh, all the neurons are speaking some language and there's like i just like with like a magnetic field made lots of neurons active that will be in the wrong language and therefore i can't even figure out how that works and that's why kind of i mean like 
the C. elegans, the worm that you mentioned earlier, the worm is not what we ultimately want to understand. Now, I want to understand the, bri the human brain. We all want to understand the human brain. But the nice thing about the worm is I think we can figure out which language the neurons speak and we can figure out causality. Why? There's 302 neurons. We can see all of them at the same time. We know what every single neuron is doing. And we can go in with lasers and zap them, every one of them, and every combination of them to find out kind of how they talk with one another. And therefore, C. elegans might be part of the path that we must take if we want to understand human thinking. Right. So, so uh, uh, could you, I, I mean, share the similarities? Because here with C. elegans, there's just 302 odd neurons. But with humans, I mean, it's extremely, extremely complicated with trillions of synaps synapses and 80 billion neurons. Are there some learnings from C. elegans which is helpful in understanding the human brain? So the question is, what do you mean with learning? So almost anything that's useful that we've done, or like many things that are useful with human brains, we first prototype them on worms. Take connectomics that you mentioned. Like we can us take pieces of monkey or human brains and reconstruct all the cells in a little tissue there. Where did it start? It started in the worm. In fact, we've had the full connectome and the connectome is just how every neon is connected to every other neon. We had the full connectome of the of the worm C. elegans many, many years ago. And now, as you mentioned it, we now have it from the fru fruit fly. And there's no reason why we can't push those techniques to bigger animals. The big problem is that for science to make progress, we need to know when we are right and we need to know when we are wrong. In neuroscience, in human neuroscience, no one's ever wrong. Why is no one ever wrong? Because you couldn't find out that you're wrong. Now, like you measure something and then you interpret the something. Um, but you're in this incredibly complicated system with many billions of neurons. So it's very, very difficult to know or even provide evidence that you're wrong about something. But if you can't find out that you're wrong about something, you can't figure out what's true. And the nice thing about C. elegans is that we can figure out when we are right and when we are wrong, because we can kind of do the experiments to, to like check if we are right. And so that's why for me, the next obvious step for at least parts of neuroscience is to go back to the worm and see if we can actually understand the worm. And once we're there, we can then push towards humans. And uh, causality is one big problem. Now, like the cool thing about, let, let, let's talk about why causality is so difficult. The reason why it's so difficult to find out if A influences B is because there can always be something else, C, that affects both A and B. Now, in the worm, if we talk about how neurons talk with one another, we see all the Cs. And because we see all the other neurons, they cannot, they cannot introduce that effect between A and B because we recall those other neurons and we can correct for that. So therefore, in C. elegans, this like danger that there's always another thing that we don't yet see that can affect us isn't there because we see it all at the same time. But in the human brain, well, the world record, and, and we described this thing that we called it Stevenson's law. So every six years, the number of brain neurons that humans record doubles, which is great. No, it's exponential growth. It's like Moore's law. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's just, it will take hundreds of years because before we could realistically following that rule, would record from the whole brain. Now, like we're currently, the world record is like in the few thousand neurons at a time. But a few thousand is like nothing relative to the billions of neurons that we all have in our brains. So basically, because we only see this tiny subset of it, if we see what neuron A does and what neuron B does, we can never know what neuron A does to neuron B unless we put up. And we can only put up like one neuron in an experiment or one brain area in an experiment. So we are kind of like... It's, it's like trying to understand how human society works by 
basically listening in on like how many tweets are sent out of a city or something. Like, I like that analogy, you know, like how, like the way we currently try to understand, uh, understand brains is the only thing we measure is how many tweets are sent by city. And we're trying to understand how society works. And we're coming up with all these wrong ideas of how society works, which is like, you know, like as the sun goes around in the morning, people send a lot of tweets and then like it moves further, the sun moves further around our planet. And we will be in this wrong belief that it's kind of like, it's that uh, that kind of tweets are made by other tweets that are on the same time zone without knowing what a time zone is because we don't know about the existence of the sun. Now, in this case, we could find out the existence of the sun by basically there's this wave of activity always going around the world. But what if there wasn't that sun that is like very easy, but it, the sun was really lots of people who talk with one another. And so I think the the belief that people have about being close to understand humans is just an illusion. We can predict things. We don't understand things. The beginning of the conversation, you mentioned that your interest is also in brain disease, figuring out brain disease. And when there is neurological disorder has been, is thought of something which is like an irreversible condition, you know, but then there are a lot of these startups who are leveraging neuroscience, neurotech, uh, brain computer in interfaces to change this narrative. Are we anywhere close to possibly maybe start reversing these neural conditions like mental diseases, uh, Down syndromes and, and stuff like that? Look, there's, there's a whole bunch of things where we're not even close, but where we are doing really successful work, um, ranging, uh, not like we now know that, say, uh, physical activity is like a wonderful, has wonderful influences on all kinds of activities, not like for dementia and depression, it seems that just physical activity, get out there, go get walking, <laughs> talk with friends, that these things are very effective. We know for depression, like uh, physical activity, hang out with your friends, there's all kinds of things that have very strong influences. Um, there is like the more narrow domain where there's a lot of startup that believe that you could do brain computer interface, brain stimulator, for more or less lifestyle things. This is a largely unregulated space and there's a lot of snake oil. I'd say the vast, vast majority of things that I'm seeing is just, they are basically taking naive people and they're taking their money and they have very little promise startups in that space. That being said, you know, like there are new emerging things, you know, like there is the whole, uh, there's the whole psychedelics as treatments for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder range of things. This is like a lot of those areas where there are promising things. The problem in all those areas is they tend to be, they tend to be not very rigorous. So they, they run trials, but those trials are maybe not properly blinded. They, there's a lot, which is very difficult, you know, like psychedelics psychedelics another logic of of good medicine is that we randomize things and that the doctor can't know what how the patient was randomized and the patient can't know how they're randomized no try that with psychedelics and like how are you going to give someone like a psychedelic and they don't know that they're in that in that group so it's very very difficult to run those things in a rigorous way which which produces all kinds of risks that, again, snake oil is sold as, sold as treatments. What are your views on AGI? Would you be able to define it first? A and then do you think these large language models, which you know some of them claim that have these emerging properties, can lead to uh, artificial general intelligence or, you know, a brain inspired approach? What, what, what is, maybe it will be great if you could kind of first, first of all, your, give, give your views on, uh, define maybe AGI and, and then maybe thoughts on what could be that approach of building an AGI, if it's possible to build artificial general intelligence. It's possible because it has happened, you know, like per definition, 
uh, humans have AGI, <laughs> but like uh, we do have general intelligence, we can solve all kinds of problems. It's notoriously difficult to define what we're looking for in AGI. I think the the logic that I most like is saying that that I'd call something AGI if it is as good as humans at dealing with entirely new situations. And this like new situation is very important to me. Now, like if you have a very large training set, then most things most things have already been set. Most things are in our training set. Um, a lot of the amazing abilities of AGI that uh, of of current large language models are actually leakage in a way. Like the training set contains a version of what we'll eventually test on it, and we've got to be very very careful there. Um, so, but for me, it's really like. I would want these systems to be good at completely new tasks that have never been encountered by any human before. That exists all the time. You know, like companies come up with new strategies, like humans decide to do new endeavors. Um, that's what I'm looking for. So, so stuff that is very far out of domain and stuff that is changing over time. And um, and I think like. You, the human mind is particularly good at dealing with the futures. And I think the AGI system, uh, the, the, the AI systems that we have at this moment are very good at dealing with old prompts, with prompts that are close to prompts they already have in their training set. Um, with that comes, you know, like you, you asked, how close are LLMs? Um, I think they are not close at all. And I think it's an illusion that they're so close. And like we're now using basic here as training set all the things that have ever uh, that ever been written by human beings. Give and take a little bit. You know, like, but like of that order of magnitude. Now, most ideas have been that are relevant to today's world have been spoken about by humans and like what are LLMs great at like solve simple coding problems like guess what like the world has like so much coding that human beings have done already so it's relatively easy to do things there the thing is just that these systems are notoriously brittle outside of the training domain now you can say they're good at like word exchanges you know like I tell you like pizza's tastes great and they understand that pizza tastes great and pizza tastes fantastic and I love pizza like all I like very similar statements and it can generalize like that so if you want it has a like pretty clever generalization function but that generalization function doesn't get you out of domain like it can't reason meaningfully in many step ways now the way we do multi-step reasoning like you can say like all the interesting things where you, we really have thoughts are chains of thoughts now the way it solves chains of thoughts is it basically says well let's use an llm for the individual thoughts and then iterate and people have the thought that that's also how humans think but i think there's a certain sense of disillusionment now where we where we no longer, where LLMs, once we think a little harder about how they work, don't seem to promise so much like deep thoughts and are more like, so my personal model has evolved. When they came up first, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the best thing I've ever seen. This is like, so like, it felt a little bit like humans. But as time went on, like my model of how LLMs work shifted a little from thinking towards clever web search. Now you can say what I mean with clever web search and like for web search tradition, I need to use the right words. And over time, kind of Google like started like allowing me like a little flexibility there. But it seems much more, and you can give mathematical reasons for that. You know, like you can say in a certain way of thinking about linearization, there is the it does something very similar to look up and we we could go into much more detail there but if it's a little bit more like a lookup thing it it means that it's not actually doing the things that us humans might want 
intelligence to do. It's very far from intelligence. The real intelligence comes from like chaining thoughts together. And I don't think current LLMs are very good at that. Let me give you another take on that. Now, like, I always like seeing both sides of of the metal. Now, like the the negative take that I just gave you is like, well, it's kind of like a little bit like web lookup. It's not all that impressive. The positive take is, of course, the things that LLMs do now, we couldn't have imagined three years ago. I also want to like do a little, I, I think people listen too much to authority in this world, but a lot of my friends that are like, you no, know, I lead C for LMB, which is the program that funded uh, that funded deep learning when everyone thought it was a bad idea. Uh, the program that brought together people like Jan Lekon and Joshua Benjo, that program is full of like prime innovators in that space. A lot of those folks feel like we're getting into AGI territory very quickly. Um, I think in me being rather skeptical about it, I'm a little bit of an outlier in that domain. Um, although like, like even people like Jan Lekun don't foresee AGI coming like very soon at all. Um, but at the same time, would I be surprised if we get very much into those areas within like a small number of decades. No, I wouldn't be very surprised. Would I be surprised if it happens next year? I would be very, very surprised. I'd be happy to take bets about that. Um, and it will, pr so, so in any case, uh, you see that it's, it's a space about which we have a lot of uncertainty at this point of time. Right. I, I think, yeah, I think that's a great take because uh, there is so much which is happening, which we obviously don't completely understand because the under the hood, what these LLMs are doing, you know, they say that it's got some emergent properties and, and, and things like that. And you rightfully pointed out, I mean, you know, to, to you know, the positive side of these LLMs are that, you know, it's kind of, it, it's doing some awesome things as well as it, it's democratized technology is given access to anybody and anyone who wants to kind of tinker around with technology, you know, you can, uh, you, you, you can create designs, you can create 3D, you can create world buildings for game, you can do game designs, you can write code. So yes, I think it's uh, definitely made technology really, really accessible. What are your thoughts on the human brain being a computer? Because a lot of people you know, give that as an, an uh, analogy that the human brain is a computer. If it is, I mean, how is there a way do you, I mean, you know, we reverse uh, engineer the brain and would that be the right approach to like building, like you said, you know, you, uh, artificial general intelligence, humans are artificially, uh, generally intelligent. Would that be the approach of uh, going towards AGI? Uh, well, it's always been a parallel view now, like where you could say, how do we going to get towards intelligence? Do we get it by copying nature or do we do it by more engineering? And I think the history has always been that we're somewhat inspired by brains. Now, there's lots of ideas coming from brain science and cognitive science in today's uh, uh, GPT systems. And um, but at the same time, the number of insights has been relatively small and also it's i mean the architectures are very different now, like your brain doesn't look like a large language model your brain looks very very different and um so i think a lot of people believe that uh, the brain has gotten less relevant there and i think that that's a mistake and i think it's a mistake that comes from them not understanding how data inefficient their systems are. Now, like you, you only get a lifetime of experience and, and humans are much faster at dealing with new situations than AI systems. Um, in fact, like you could maliciously say the reason why neuroscience might be useful in that area is because if I say I'm a neuroscientist, people will let me play with something for like a few years before they say, well, your system's not working. Whereas if you're just AI, it's very difficult to innovate. And like, because people want you to innovate and have state of the art, SOTA, that's what everyone's into. But 
if I need to deliver soda tomorrow, I can't innovate because because the way to get the best state of the art tomorrow is by just trying small changes to what I already have. So any new idea, any real innovation can't survive if we drive for that. If you say that what you do is neuroscience, they at least give you a few years of playing with things and that often allows you to like actually innovate. But um, when it comes to how the future looks like, it's very unclear. Now you could say there could be futures where we can actually take a concrete brain and simulate it. Maybe there will be an eddy brain in like a vat somewhere that we can like eventually simulate and, and you can live happily in your digital simulation. It's a little unclear for me why we, we, we should be doing that. Some people view it as a safety mechanism against AI because we'd have like simulated AGIs that could think very, very rapidly. Um, and it might be a way of doing that. Uh, personally, I think the AI danger that people perceive isn't credible, and therefore I'm not at all concerned about that. Right. You mentioned that someday we would be able to kind of simulate Eddie's brain and possibly upload it onto a, a, a digital substrate. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the others who kind of claim that we are actually already living in a simulated universe? Yeah, it's a wonderful argument. Like for people maybe who don't know the argument yet, um, it's pretty clear that with human capabilities, we'll be able to simulate far more humans than are alive in a computer in the future. Um, in such a scenario, we couldn't know, do we live in the real world or do we live in the simulation? And in a world where there's therefore far more simulated humans than real humans, the probability that you're simulated is almost one because like you don't know which one of all those like all the people you are. And out of that comes like, well, and maybe we already live in a simulation because kind of it's like simulations all the way down. And um, it is a somewhat logically appealing argument. I'm not sure if it matters. Not like you can say for our decisions, if our world comes from like a meta world who simulates us or our world is just as real as it is, what's the right behavior for us is probably the same. Not like if we accept that other, you know, like you can say at some level, like physics simulates us. Not like, does it matter if like, we are physics simulated or we are simulated by computer science one layer up. Well, like computer science one layer up would be physics for us. So like anything that we would find ethically good should still be good if we declare that we're in a simulation. So at some level, I'm not sure if it matters, um, but it, it feels like it's something that we can't say much about and therefore like, uh, not like you, can't uh, if 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 a god exists that who doesn't interfere with our world we cannot because like by definition the world would be following the laws of physics set by that external god if that's a god or that's a programmer or that's just something else is maybe not all that like behaviorally relevant for us but but those are deep and fun questions Right. Yeah. So yes, obviously, I mean, it really doesn't really matter. But yes, I've been invested in virtual reality metaverse. And we've been building these uh, virtual worlds. And every year, the progress is so insane, you know, because we are able to build these uh, virtual worlds, which is going more and more closer to realism you know because we're building these photorealistic world you know and these photorealistic worlds we are uh adding integrating these ai layers where these non-playing characters are becoming intelligent what if someday we could completely structurally and functionally map out the human brain and be able to upload it on a quantum computer then uh theoretically yes i mean we could build a simulation where uh where you know the the beings inside the co the computer would not uh, be able to understand whether they in a physical or, or a virtual world, but yeah, it it actually doesn't really matter. Would, would you be but, able? But what what I don't understand is why anyone would want to do that. You know, like if 
like what's the benefit of simulating people in a simulation it feels like yeah it feels like pretty pointless and like it it would mean that someone throws a lot of compute and compute arguably is is a limited resource at least in our universe so there's a lot of compute at like simulating a world what's the point like right no no so like, I, i completely understand but you know i i think you know all the big businesses are built on simulation because through simulation we understand are able to you know better predict uh, on what a uh, 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 a machine can do so maybe it's a simulation to kind of you know uh, you, you might end up building simulations to better understand how human being exists I, I, i don't really know whether yeah. I, <laughs> but you you can say maybe people build simulations to try things but that's not how our world feels like you know like it's not like that my life feels like i'm being confronted with like hundreds of different versions of coca cola to find out like which one's going to be like best for my taste buds you know like it feels like this is a world that has like real richness and feels like feels like it's kind of meaningful in a way that is well beyond that isn't like testing it feels like if someone wrote this world as a simulation to test something then they're really not very good at planning their experiments uh, completely fair enough would you be able to share uh, your updates from the coding lab and you're also the co-director of sifa learning in machines and brain programs can you also talk maybe some of your works research updates over there Yeah sure like like look like in my lab I'm very much interested in figuring out how the elegance works and building a simulation of that I think it's simply we need to make neuroscience be truly quantitative and the clean way to do that in my view is to basically start simulating nervous systems that's the only way in my view to actually know if we're on the right path you know, like because we can test how good we are by looking at out of domain generalization for that so i'm very much pushing a big international coalition towards like moving into that direction so that's what i'm personally in my lab uh, very much interested in on top of like ai related questions um at sifa lmb i think the directions that a lot of people are now thinking are at those interfaces you know like how can we get ai to go beyond what current systems have you know like how can we produce an ai system that understands causality that's something we've been working a lot on the last few years i think how can we build ai systems that are good at dealing with human beings you know like ultimately like a lot of ai of people view ai as like moving into the space of humans and i personally think it should be moving into the space of electrical drills what do i mean with that now like an electrical drill is like it has something that used to be very human which is like physical labor and yet it's kind of productized and built into like a packaging that makes it be like we got at that one thing that we wanted to be good which is like put holes into walls and in the same way i see like ai being much less like in the space of humans because it's not humans but be in the space of tools so like cars that like automatically efficiently route us through the world personal assistants that are like really good at like booking us flights when we want to like visit east asia or something like kind of like i expect it to be much more like built into tools and like when electrical motors came they weren't built into electrical drills it was like you had like your electrical motor in a factory and you built the whole factory around it that's the stage where we're in ai we're like okay let's build like stuff around the ai system that we have instead of a product focus which is kind of like look people need to find where their friends are and they want to have like someone ahead hey, do you know that your friend john is just like 300 yards from here why don't you two like go and have coffee like you'll both enjoy it like kind of like we want to have those things but we want them like productized in a meaningful way we don't want like this totally amorphous like ai like living around us like oh my god i really don't want that 
but I want it like for certain things, so like maybe with people who don't speak my language, I want an AI system in my ear that like translates everything in real time. That's what I mean with products. We don't want like intelligence isn't valuable in and of itself. We want AI systems that do the things that are useful for us. Not like and you told like, talk me me through it. Like not like with computer games, we want them like make that scenery be like awesome. That's like a product. That's something that's like I want a realistic. Give me a realistic forest here that has like all the things that forests have. Like it's a very well defined thing, and we are seeing like we're seeing the early stages of that productization. Not like take like Photoshop. Not like you can be like make that person who photo bombs you like go away. Boom! Like very easy. Like it's a it's a product. It's like meaningful. And I think like if anything, we'll see AI become like less like AI and more like producty. And I think that's the transition that like the people that are, that we have in CIFA, they're like the real innovators in that AI space. And I think there's going to be a next round of this where AI more becomes like the fabric of products. And then we need to ask, okay, like, are there generalizable ways how we can think about like AI becoming like meaningful as part of like human centric things? How can we align AI with humans? But also like, how can we get insights about humans that generalize to AI? Now, like you and me, we think about the world in terms of like stories, in terms of like causal relations, in, person, in terms of personal relationships. Can we now bring that way of thinking causally about the world also into artificial systems? How oh, how cool would that be? Uh, looking forward <laughs> for a world like that. Uh, you, you're also the founder of Community for Rigor and Neuromatch.io. Would you like to give an overview of both of the companies? Yes, and I think they are both initiatives that are very important. Let me start with Community for Rigor. People do science. Um, we now understand that a lot of science that we do isn't very helpful. That includes non-reproducing science. Now, if you try and reproduce scientific work and you try and you do everything as good as you can as described in the paper, it often doesn't reproduce. But that is the tip of the iceberg. In reality, if you then dig a little bit deeper, a lot of papers confuse correlation with causation. Of those that do replicate and don't confuse correlation with causation. A lot of them are papers that have been done before and the authors never quite realized that. And of those that are actually new and don't confuse correlation with causation and that replicate, a lot of them kind of make other elementary mistakes in all kinds of aspects of it. And um, so Community for Rigor is an initiative NIH funded that aims at helping scientists kind of do better science across the whole gamut of what that means. By the way, it includes machine learning. Like what companies often do is they have a training set and a test set. And uh, we all know we have to do cross-validation or like we have to divide our data into a training set and a test set. But if my team gets to see the test set and try algorithms and inno innovate on the test set, over time, the algorithms will get much better than they will be in a deployment scenario. So once you then try and build that into products, it stops working. So that's community for rigor. Maybe most interesting for some of your audience is uh, neuromatch.io. So neuromatch.io primarily runs summer schools. It runs summer schools. And it runs them online, but not like a MOOC, but it's based on groups. So you have groups that jointly, that learn together. And we build great teaching materials for that. But we also then build teaching assistant led group where in a group of like 15 people or so, people really go through that material. So if you want like, it has like the benefits of scalability of things like MOOCs, but it, it feels like a small university endeavor. So we try to kind of make it feel a little like you're studying at a great university, like University of Pennsylvania, but in a way that allows access to far more people. And that way we, we serve a couple thousand students every summer. Awesome. And we teach them the machine learning and we teach them neuroscience and we teach them climate science and like a whole bunch of courses. Well, tech is, is something where we, we are constantly building tech and, and we live in a cap capitalistic world and, and where profit at any cost is, you know, right up there. 
with what that that leads towards is, is centralized technology and, and then you know rich gets richer poor gets poorer what what's what's your your dream world what what do you think is is going to be the ideal world the ideal world i think we all agree on that you know like an ideal world is where all people meaningfully get to participate in an endeavor that makes life better for everyone um there are some aspects of that that i can personally do something about you know like i'm a new scientist and i try through neuromatch to teach a lot of people to do good neuroscience and through community for we guy try to teach scientists to do better science i also keep reminding scientists to why we are doing science you know like we're not doing science because because somehow doing science in itself is great we are doing science with the ultimate goal of making the world better for people that's why ultimately we want to cure diseases we want to put up policies that allow people to participate in decisions that affect their lives um now let's be clear now like the rich get richer um the rich don't get richer so so uh, at least worldwide inequality has gone way down now, like look at the success stories of like india and uh, china and a lot of development in lots of comp- uh, countries the inequality worldwide has been going down uh, progress hasn't been great in the richest countries but in parts that's because like the world is becoming global i think connectivity has gotten has gotten much better now like my group has always had people from so many countries now, like i had iranians and indians and uh, kind of like there must have been 20 countries that are just in my lab alone so like kind of like the world is getting much more connected and that's just a wonderful development with opportunities for people coming from everywhere and um i think like no like we want to we should work together on like making it that disease no diseases are horrible no like people like lose so much good time they had could have spent uh, to those and i want to like uh, men- maybe mention one area that i think not enough people think about which is friendship now, like what are the things that make life great now like and we have a lot of evidence for that like having a great partner like uh, uh, is really meaningful and like my wife most certainly makes me happy having meaningful jobs is important having uh, having no diseases uh, is really important having no addiction is really important and having friends is important and so many people think about these other factors but i think like friendship is really what helps holds much of the world together and i i would wish that companies and tech people would be much more mindful about the importance of human relationships yeah I really really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast I mean you left us in a profound note I think friendship and connectivity I think yes and maybe I was wrong the world is becoming much better there is more accessibility of resources and we we definitely getting better maybe I'm possibly pointing out to maybe just one company or holding uh, or, or having a, you know building working towards a- agi you know maybe maybe possibly that's what i was trying to say but yes i think we're getting into a so sorry I'm, i think you're saying something no but look you you're exactly right but look we have tools for that it's called antitrust so there is regulation and would the world be safer and more equal with better access and a more thriving innovation ecosystem if we broke apart the big tech giants like yes <laughs> like like we shouldn't in centralization of ai power is a very big concern like basically all the scenarios i can come up with age where where the development to ai is really bad are the cases where ai is centralized in a small number of companies i like that i like the electrical drill analogy here and like if we build ai into electrical drills everyone has it we don't need to go through like the the common railroad company that has the monopoly that everyone has to use that railroad now like we all have it 
in our pockets, we should all walk towards a world in which AI is a tool that everyone can use instead of AI being something dominated by a small number of companies. And yes, we need the classical tools we have for that, which is as soon as we have these big monopolists, we need to think about ways of breaking them apart for the greater good of everyone. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Conrad. And I hope that, you know, this tool goes into the hands of uh, everyone. So really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Thank you, Conrad. Really appreciate this. Yeah? Thank you. Bye-bye.